namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Shrimad Bhagavad Gita this is chapter 8 text 22 Purusha, Purusha, the Supreme Personality, Saha, He, Para, the Supreme, than whom no one is greater, Partha, O Son of Prita, Bhakja, my devotional service, Labhya, can be achieved, Tu, but, Ananyaya, unalloyed, undeviating devotion, yasya, his, antakstani, within, bhutani, all this material manifestation, yena, by whom, sarvam, all, idam, whatever we can see, tatam, Distributed. Distributed. Translation. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is greater than all, is attainable by unalloyed devotion. Although he is present in his abode, he is all-pervading and everything is situated within him. Purport. It is clearly stated, it is here clearly stated, that the Supreme Destination, from which there is no return, is the abode of Krishna, the Supreme Person. The Brahma Samhita describes the supreme abode as an ananda chinmaya rasa, a place where everything is full of spiritual bliss. Whatever variegatedness is manifest there is all of the quality of spiritual bliss. There is nothing material. All variegatedness is expanded as the spiritual expansion of the supreme Godhead himself, for the manifestation there is totally of the spiritual energy, as explained in chapter 7. As far as this material world is concerned, Although the Lord is always in His supreme abode, He is nonetheless all-pervading by His material energy. So by His spiritual and material energies, He is present everywhere, both in the material and the spiritual universes. Isyantakstani means that everything is sustained by Him, whether it be spiritual or material energy. It is clearly stated here that only by bhakti or devotional service can one enter into the Vaikuntha, spiritual planetary system, In all the Vaikuntas, there is only one Supreme Godhead, Krishna, who has expanded himself into millions and millions of plenary expansions. These plenary expansions are four-armed, and they reside over the innumerable spiritual planets. They are known by a variety of names. Purushottama, Trivakrama, Keshava, Madhava, Aniruddha, Rishikesha, Sankarsana, Pajumna, Sridhar, Vasudev, Damodar, Janadan, Narayan, Vamana, Padmanabha, etc., These plenary expansions are likened unto the leaves of a tree, and the main tree is likened to Krishna. Krishna, dwelling in Goloka Vrindavan, his supreme abode, systematically conducts all affairs of both universes, material and spiritual, without a flaw, by power of his all-pervasiveness. Purushasa parakpartam bhakja labhyas tananyaya isyantakstani bhutani yena sarvam idam tatam the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is greater than all, is attainable by unalloyed devotion. Although he is present in his abode, he is all-pervading and everything is situated within him. So in the previous verse, in the previous verse, Krishna brought up the point that once returning there to this abode one never comes back to this miserable material world full of disturbing conditions again so in this verse Krishna speaks about that Supreme Personality of Godhead living within that abode. 
That means that this abode of Krishna does not refer to this Brahman effulgence alone. Although Brahman, this energy of the Supreme, is certainly included in the spiritual sky. After all, all of the universes rest within that Brahman. Isya Prabha Prabhavato Jagadanda Koti Koti Shrasesha Vasudari Vibhuti Bhinam All, the whole creation rests in Brahman. There is simply Brahman and within it all the planets of the Vaikuntha are floating. That is the spiritual sky. And that spiritual effulgence is the basis upon which everything rests. But Krishna is the basis of that basis. Brahmanaham Apatishta. I am the basis of that foundation, Brahman, which is a further basis, there's no doubt, upon which all other things are resting, including the whole material creation. But the Brahman comes from Krishna. He is situated beyond the Brahman. And in fact, he has his own planet wherein he resides. And residing on that planet, he very peacefully, pleasantly, blissfully engages in his eternal pastimes. Now, this purpose of this verse is not to discuss the different pastimes of Krishna, but rather to speak about some of the qualities of Krishna and by what means one may attain him. Quality of Krishna is that first, first of all, he is Purusha Saparapata. He's the supreme personality whom nobody is greater than. Nobody's greater than Krishna. Nobody's equal to Krishna. Huh? Asama Odva. Nobody can be equal to him. Although others may proclaim themselves to be equal, they are, of course, just fools, like Pondraka, who tried to appear before Krishna with paper arms to duplicate the forearms of Vasudeva. But although some other forms of the Supreme Lord may be, in fact, almost equal to Krishna, because they are plenary expansions, complete expansions of the Supreme Lord. But still, Krishna is the source of all of them. That personality, he is superior to even all of his expansions because he's the original source from which they emanate. So, here it is stated, Bhakti Labhyas Tananyaya One may obtain Krishna by bhakti in no other way. Although he is nearer to all than anything else, being that he is situated within our hearts, directly next to us, who could be nearer than that? He's within our heart, or within this material framework's heart but situated transcendentally next to the spirit soul. He's as close practically as our very self. Yet, although he's so close, so near, he's far away as well. Because we may not realize that position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as being very near to us due to our material contaminations. It is only by bhakti that one may know Krishna. One may know the super soul by meditative process. That's possible. By meditating on the absolute truth, by following the yogic system and practice, 
one can uh, understand Paramatma. He can come to the point of realizing the Supreme Lord within the heart. But when he meditates on that Supreme and he becomes attached to him and develops some love for him, then at that time only may he begin the process of bhakti. Bhakti means there's love involved, love and devotion for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is not an ordinary activity. It is not simply some kind of yogic practice. It is not something functional or formula business. Yeah. Where you follow this instruction, this instruction, this instruction, like a recipe for a cake. And boom, you get a cake. No. It is a function of the soul. Bhakti is the natural quality of the spirit soul. Everybody is eternally Krishna's devotees. Nitya Siddha Krishna Bhakti Sajya Kabunoi. Shravanadi Shuddha Chitta Kori Udai. However, hardly anybody knows that because we're all covered. Covered by the material nature. Covered by material contamination. Therefore, we don't understand our eternal position. In fact, we have rejected our conscious awareness of that position because we are fools, number one. But, Krishna says, that Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, is only attainable. He says, you can only know me by pure devotion. Now, this is one of the three different places in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna clearly says this. Hmm. The most famous being uh, bhakti mam abhijanati. Without devotional service, you cannot know Krishna. Only by bhakti may you understand the Supreme Personality of God and as He is. No other method may do it. Krishna could have said, He had plenty of opportunity in Bhagavad Gita to have said, Yoga mam abhijanati. He could have said it right here. Yoga, labhyas, sananyaya. Would have fit poetically. <laughs> Jnana, labhyas, sananyaya. Also fits poetically. Karma, labhyas, sananyaya. It also fits poetically. In fact, he could have said anything he wanted right there. And he does say what he wants. Krishna is not one to use words carelessly. It is Krishna's words are amazingly deep. Yeah. We have seen, we have been reading this Bhagavad Gita some 16 years, and in this version, and we find that every time we go through these verses, they simply get better deeper. Because Krishna's words are not ordinary. Krishna's words are very deep. You can enter into the understanding of this philosophy through Bhagavad Gita deeper and deeper and deeper and always find a point which is very nice to talk about. And one doesn't get bored. It's not that you get bored speaking about Bhagavad Gita every night. It's very nice. You, you like that. Why? Because Krishna's words are always very nice. Krishna's words never become stale. It's not like they were nice four days ago. Like again, that old cake example. But after some days, that wonderful, fantastic cake, you can bang it with a hammer. It gets so hard. So, uh, Krishna's words are not like that. They're timeless, ever fresh. That's what is amazing about absolute knowledge. It never goes stale. 
never goes bad. All the knowledge in the material world is rotten after a short period of time. Or else it's so stale that nobody cares about it anymore. We have found stale means like the cake that goes after four or five days hard. That means stale. So, anyway, just like we have um, Greek philosophers. Formerly, people were into Greek philosophers. Nowadays, nobody has the faintest idea in the world what any of them said. And they don't even care. And neither does anyone else. Stale. Old. Then you've got all kinds of other philosophers. Your early uh, Christian mystical philosophers. Your medieval philosophers of various kinds. Your early British empiricists of various kinds. German empiricists. Existentialists. This, that, and the other thing. All kinds of classes of philosophers. But who cares about philosophy nowadays? Hardly anybody talks about classical philosophers. Nowadays, the big fashion is you think up your own philosophy. Whatever philosophy it is that appeals to you, you make that your philosophy. In whatever way you like, you think it up. And then you follow that. Self-concocted systems of religious practice, philosophical practice. Because these other systems become stale very quickly. Nobody likes them. No more juice. Dried up. Dried up. That's exactly the right term. All juice gone. Of course, as far as we are concerned, these philosophies of materialism were dried up as soon as they were given. They were given dry. Born stale. <laughs> it's like baking a cake and it comes out of the oven stale. <laughs> Instant five-day-old cake. Straight out of the oven. Still hot and stale. This is, of course, the material world. And the symptom of such kinds of knowledge is that after a short time, everybody forgets all about it and couldn't care less. That's one of the symptoms of stale knowledge. Whereas Krishna's words have been studied for thousands of years by everybody all over the place. Bhagavad Gita is a very famous book. It has appeared in hundreds and hundreds of translations. And this book always brings New knowledge to whoever reads it. Even if a speculator reads it, he always finds newer and newer ways to speculate. If a Mayavadi reads it, he finds newer and newer proofs of the oneness. It's so ever fresh that even these fools and rascals find something in it. But Krishna said that if you think like this, being a fool and rascal or a materialist or whatever you are, then you do not understand me you may understand some point which is very nice in the mind to spin around. But, Krishna says, only by bhakti you may understand me. Bhaktya labhyas tananyaya. You'll only understand me by devotion. Therefore, Krishna's words are understood by a devotee. Therefore, Prabhupada had to deliver this Bhagavad Gita. There are other editions of Bhagavad Gita. In, uh, in English, there are hundreds of editions. Maybe by now, 400 different versions you could buy, published at one time or another. I'm sure there are plenty of versions in Sweden too. All bogus. Why? Because they're all done by scholars, not by devotees. If you're a scholar, you can't enter into the mystery of Bhagavad Gita the rahasyam. It's a mystery. It's only available for those who are devoted. 
Then you can understand the mystery of Bhagavad Gita. And then you can understand the depth of it. Now, from as far as we are concerned, Bhagavad Gita is not much of a mystery. It's very straightforward what Krishna is saying. Yes, because we are devotees. It is straightforward. But for the non-devotee class of man, it's very difficult. And in any case, we understand it only because Prabhupada gave it to us. If we were also just given the verses without the explanations, and we were to understand all, all things just by verses alone, we'd have a real hard time to understand the depth of each and every verse. We would have a very difficult time because the depth of understanding comes through the mercy of the devotee. The devotee expands the depth of the understanding of Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Vedic literatures because he understands the intention of Krishna. It is not just a question of language. It is a question of concept. Krishna, of course, uses language in very funny ways, too. Amusing ways, when he's uh, playing with his devotees. He will make jokes with words in the most exquisite fashion, which just leaves his devotees completely struck with wonder, their soul, amazed at what Krishna just said. Whatever he does is just fantastic in every respect. So anyway, Krishna is presenting Bhagavad Gita so filled, but with deep philosophical meaning, each and every verse. But Bhagavad Gita is still simple enough for us to understand. That's why Krishna spoke it on the battle of, battlefield of Kurukshetra, because it was something we can understand. Arjuna understood it within 45 minutes. We could understand it perhaps in 45 years, but that's not bad. <laughs> Considering the relative difference between us and Arjuna. If you do understand Bhagavad Gita completely in 45 years, that means you're in pretty good shape. After all, that may still be within one's lifetime. And if he fully realizes the purport of Bhagavad Gita, as Arjuna did, and surrenders to that, and engages in service in that way, oh, how glorious that life is. Mm. But to understand Krishna means you've got to come to the point of bhakti. Pure, unalloyed bhakti. Savai pumso paro dharmo yatho bhakti hoksaje. Bhakti yoga is considered to be the topmost form of activity in the religious field or dharma, natural activities, occupational duties. It is the topmost activity, which is done for the satisfaction of Adhokshaja, Krishna, who is beyond all material conceptions, beyond all knowledge within this material world. Haitakiya, Pratiyata, Yanatma superseded. It is done without any cause, causeless, no material cause, and ceaselessly, because after all, bhakti is a condition of the soul. And that means eternal. So when one engages steadily in that devotional service, that means he's actually contacted the soul. But if one is doing some service, giving it up, doing something, giving it up, doing something, that means still material consciousness is there with beginning and an end. I start, I finish something, I do something else. But when one is on the platform of the soul, he comes to that eternal platform of service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is never halted under any circumstances. And that actually satisfies the soul. That unceasing devotional service always satisfies the living entity. Because that is his nature. The living entity's nature is to serve Krishna. So the best way to satisfy is to always engage in Krishna's service. Be personally satisfied. And it is stated in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Yam labdva chaparam labham manyante nadikam tataha Yasmin sito guru nati vichalyate A very significant verse 
when you attain this platform of Krishna consciousness, one will think there is no greater gain to be gained. One thinks, I have achieved the topmost platform of gain. And despite all kinds of circumstances which would automa- ordinarily cause one to be shaken in his conviction, one will be fixed in Krishna consciousness. That was, of course, a very significant verse for Arjuna. Yeah. Because Arjuna was just about to embark on a huge battle where there are plenty of reasons to become a little bit shaky in your Krishna consciousness when all kinds of arrows and other things are flying at you, ready to chop you up into pieces. Uh, you tend to develop some fearful conditions and other conditions which ordinarily might not be very ideal for establishing Krishna consciousness. After all, a battlefield is not generally considered the best place to go and chant one's rounds. (laughs) So, Arjuna utilized this opportunity of such a fearful situation to surrender more to Krishna. After all, Krishna was telling him that despite all kinds of frightful, fearful, or agitating circumstances that uh, one will be situated beyond them, situated in transcendence. That also, Krishna says in another place, Dira stachanamuyanti. The Dira, stita Dira munir uchite. Dira is a special word. It means steady, fixed. Actually, it means more than steady. It means un- immovable. Stita dhi. Fixed and immovable in Krishna consciousness. One, in the first verse he's saying, there is Tachinamuyanti, one who is actually fixed in knowledge of the change of the body at the time of death. He is not bewildered in any way, by that change of body. We find that those who have some understanding of spiritual knowledge do not lament at the time of death and do not hanker for material things, but without attachment attain the abode of the Lord. This is certainly the significant uh, factor in Krishna consciousness which separates it from all other processes right there. In other processes, one is trained to be attached to material power. Some people are very interested in controlling others. Some do it by mental concoctive methods. Others do it by physical force. Some do it by mystic power. Some are interested in the mystic power so that they can gain great opulences. They can travel here and there, accomplish all different things that may be very nice from the material point of view. And others, they may just simply be interested in sense gratification. But we find that people are interested in all kinds of material things with material powers Uh, simply with the idea of becoming very great in the material world. Uh, Therefore, they remain very much attached in this material world. But the devotee, he is not interested in such things. So at the time of death, he never thinks about such things. But the materialist, at the time of death, being that he's too much attached, to some kind of material perfection like that, he thinks about these things at the time of death. And he laments that perhaps now they're going to be lost. Therefore, he is not steady at the moment of death. He's not steady. His intelligence is wavering. He's not fixed. And it happens that he takes birth again somewhere in the material world in order to continue 
all of his attempts to enjoy and control. Sometimes they try to glorify the attempt to be the enjoyers and controllers of the material world by calling it some kind of process or philosophy. You can call it whatever you like. It's still the same maya in a different bag. Sometimes it's in a very sophisticated bag, the procedures that are meant for enjoying and control. We call it intellectual processes. We call it social development. We call it economic activity. It's still the exact same thing. We want to take the position of God to be the enjoyers and controllers. Therefore, we are very much eager to control others in this world. We like that. That's our propensity. But that is born of Maya. In Maya, one is eager to manipulate the material world and others within it. One may think it's for a good cause, one may think it's not for a good cause, it doesn't matter. As soon as one is starting to get into the realm of being the controller or enjoyer, then he is starting to interfere with that realm that is actually the business of the Supreme Lord alone or his representatives. Therefore, one should learn that this temporary material world filled with different, different miserable conditions is situated here just as a prison house for fools and rascals like us who are simply interested in enjoying and controlling the material world. It's just like when you want a small child to be happy, you tell him, okay, look, here's a sandbox and I'm giving you all these tools. Here's a shovel, here's a truck. <laughs> Now, you build up a big empire here in the sandbox. My child is building this and building that, making castles out of sand and other things. And he's very happy doing that, because he's controlling that sandbox. In fact, sometimes it gets so bad, if another child wants to come in and also use the sandbox. Whoa, look out. What are you doing in my sandbox? Boom, hits him over the head with the shovel. <laughs> I'm the controller here in this sandbox. This is my sandbox. My mother put me here. This is mine. And who are you? You better follow my rules. Now we're going to make sand like this. You can see it amongst the children. They, they follow such examples. Not our Krishna conscious children, I don't think so bad. But the normal materialist... Oh, okay change that. The normal materialistic children, they are, of course, very much eager to demonstrate their facilities as controllers because they've got that idea from previous lifetimes. Previous lifetimes, they've had this, developed this idea again and again and again for being the enjoyers and controllers of this world. So when they take birth, from their very birth, they're thinking like this. And as soon as there's an opportunity to manifest that propensity, they do it immediately. And immediately, just these as small children, they're busy telling everybody what to do. Busy trying to manipulate everything. This is the maya. It starts with small children and it doesn't end when you get old and useless. It's just that you can no longer force anybody to do anything anymore because they don't listen to you because you're just some old bag. Therefore, they don't care. That's a nice English expression, isn't it? Old bag. It really means exactly what it says. It's about the only philosophical thing in the English language. Must have been a mistake. <laughs> that the body gets old like an old bag and becomes useless. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we find that even when one is an old bag and frustrated like that, but that same frustration, why they don't listen to me, why they don't fo follow me, why I can't control, brings that person directly into the next body. And he starts again immediately as a small boy or girl to try to manipulate this material world. So, uh, this is all due to illusion. These propensities to be the enjoyers, the controllers. Controlling propensity, born of illusion. Krishna is the supreme controller. Yeah. We find here others, other of his qualities. 
which show how he's so vastly superior to us, and therefore we are under his control. He is not under our control. And nothing within his universe is factually under our control. Even the body. <laughs> Who can control his own body? Huh? Who can control his blood pressure? Make it go up if it's too low. Make it go down if it's too high. Who can control his digestive process? Oh, not enough digestion. Okay, let's speed it up some more. Yeah. Who makes who makes his nails not grow? Such an annoyance all the time. You have to cut these things. So okay, nails don't grow anymore. It's just an annoyance. We just stay with the way, just stay the way you are. All right, all right, all right. Hair on the face, just stop coming out every morning. You got to spend so much time cutting it off. So just don't anymore come out of the face. Just stay where you are, inside. Be pl be happy. <laughs> No, no way. All these things just happen automatically. You can't control your body. You can't manipulate anything in your body. Anything that goes on is simply out of your control, with inside of it. Yeah. Maybe you can do something amazing, like lift your arm up and do something with it. Yeah. Were, were you also were we also discussing about the process of lifting the arm? No. It's a really interesting thing, just lifting your arm. If you think with your mind, arm, lift. Try it by mental practice to lift your arm. Arm, lift up. Go on, arm. Just lift right up. Go ahead. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing there? Come on. It doesn't do anything. To make it move, you have to move it. Isn't that amazing? Make experiment. The only way that arm's going to move is if you move it, not if you think about it. Even you desire it to be so, it does not move. Now, what is this moving business? <laughs> That's pretty amazing. How anything moves in the body. It's not the mind, it's not the intelligence. It's not the soul, it's not the desire. It's some, it's some physical process where we try and move and it moves. Yeah. It's a machine, this body. And it works under machine-like principles. And there are also demigods in charge of the various movements. Yeah. Now, the way they help us this, of course, doesn't mean there's somebody sitting there and just like pulling a string. Not at all. But it means that the energy by which the body starts to move into motion is all controlled. Now, of course, somebody can talk in terms of nerve impulses, which begin in the brain. But I would like to see the brain alone, controlled by the mind, cause all the things to happen in the body, like lifting of arms and running here and there. There needs to be a conscious activity of the bodily motion as well. It's not just a product of the mind. There must be something there. What is this? It's all the material energy reacting, relating. We are thinking, we are controlling but we're not even controlling our own body. Prakite kriyamana niguna karmani sarvasha. It's all done by the modes of material nature. The ways of the material nature. You can, of course, if you really like, break it down into various nerve impulses that originate in some cell somewhere in the brain. You can do that. That's okay. We don't mind because that doesn't change our point. That's also material <laughs> modes of nature business. But we, the conscious living being, we affect very little. Yeah. We control very little in the body. Although we can certainly make it sick by being in complete anxiety. If you're in complete anxiety, you're, it's an expert way to become sick. You can make the body completely sick. So that much we can do. Isn't that glorious? More special things than that we cannot do. <laughs> we can control the body very limitedly. It's a fact. 
Now, what to do if we can't even control our own bodies? Just like when you say something completely stupid that just blurts out of the mouth. And as soon as it's out there in the air, you wish you didn't say it. You wish you could just grab that with a rope and just pull it back in. But it doesn't work. And because you don't want to seem like a complete ass, you say something even more stupid after that. Isn't it? How many times that's happened? And then you start tumbling down into a pit of complete stupidity. And then finally at the end one says, ah, just forget about it. Get out of there as fast as possible. Because the body it just sometimes it says something completely stupid. Why? Because that's just life. Making a fool of oneself is one of the primary functions of the human being. <laughs> anyway, humor aside, we have a problem here. And that problem is that we are not very big controllers. In fact, we find that we are, practically speaking, the servants of the material nature. Therefore, what to do about all of that? Therefore, Krishna gives us an indication in Bhagavad Gita that he is present in his own abode, but he's situated everywhere, and everything is all situated within him. Therefore, such a great personality, who is actually causing everything to take place within this whole cosmic manifestation, he is to be served by us, not that we have to serve, not that he has to serve he is to be served by us, not that he has to serve us. We are his servants. He is not our servant. Therefore, when we try this controlling propensity, that's contradictory to Krishna's being the controller. The more we try to control, the more we contradict Krishna's natural position as controller because of his greatness. How does a person become the controller of something in the material world, to whatever degree he is? Because he has some good quality, great quality, which allows that to take place, some strength or whatever. So Krishna, by his qualification, is the strongest, most knowledgeable, most uh, beautiful, most famous, most renounced, uh, most wealthy. Therefore, because he possesses all six opulences in full, the six opposites.